Hi, I'm Guha Bala, president of Valence Studios. I'm Kartik Bala, Guha's brother, CEO of Valence Studios. You know, previously we were founders of Vicarious Visions, you know, which we started when we were both in high school back in 1991 in our parents' basement. Now, VV became part of Activision Blizzard in 2005. And we led the studio for 25 years and worked on some good games. And then we set out on a new adventure to become entrepreneurs again. We founded Balance Studios in 2016 to build a studio focused on discovery. Our desire is to build a sustainable studio with creative and financial independence where industry veteran teams could take the sort of creative risks and create new kinds of game experiences. We're a studio of around 90 employees right now uh, based in Troy, New York. And simply put, our mission is to create breakthrough games that are magic. Our first couple of games, you know, first one we launched last fall, super proud of it, Mario Kart Live Home Circuit, released October 2020 in partnership with Nintendo. Now that's a mixed reality video game that brings the Mario Kart experience into the real world by merging an AR camera enabled RC cart and a video game world into one. It was a prototype that was invented at Valen and then developed into a fully realized game in partnership with Nintendo. And just announced recently is Knockout City, a new kind of online multiplayer team-based action game in partnership with EA Originals. The core mechanic is based on the simple premise of throwing and catching a ball and amplified into a dodge brawling online game. There were so many technical and design challenges with this title, with latency being a key issue, that the team had to build a new game engine from the ground up to pull it off. Just a quick plug, we've got an upcoming cross-play beta, April 2nd through the 4th. We'd love for you to join and check it out. We think you'll like it. You know, the game will be coming out in May uh, in partnership with, with EA Originals. Now the games couldn't be more different, but their path to discovery and creation have a lot in common. You know, when we talk about the, the culture of discovery at Valen, for us, it's essential to think about convergent and divergent thinking. There's starkly different approaches to creativity. It's not that one is better than the other, but they serve very different goals. Now we hear everyone talking about innovation, but what does that really mean? Is it making something that exists better or doing something totally new? A lot of great developers focus on being the best in their craft. Now, this often overlaps with the goal of being best of what exists. They're in existing game genres. There are established game behaviors for consumers. It's easy to understand when described or you pitch or you show a trailer. And craftsmanship is key. And these are examples of convergent thinking where you're best in class. You know, most franchise extensions are based on this. It's easier to plan for, communicate, fund, and publish. Then there are developers who focus on something new. And at first, every pitch starts with, hey, this is really new. But we found that really new ideas have a few things in common. Uniqueness is key. You feel different when you play it. It has a unique emotional response. The moment to moment interaction is different. Whether it's narrative or it's a new kind of Twitch based mechanic, it feels different at its core. It's hard to describe it with just video and text. Playing is believing. You got to get it in, you know, players' hands. So it's really important overall, you know, to make an explicit choice in which way you want to go, because it becomes the basis of your culture as a studio and the business model. When we uh, decided to be a game developers, as creative people often do. We often think about the new things we're setting out to invent, to think differently. But we quickly discovered that most of the commercial opportunities that are out there were built on convergent thinking rather than divergent. There's a lot of reasons why. Convergence is iteration and craftsmanship. It's the only way to become and stay the best in class in a very competitive marketplace. Companies iterate for a variety of reasons First, they're committed to their value chains and their business models. 
The value chain is a set of organizational choices that they've made, people, infrastructure, management bias, like how you think uh, about business in the industry. Uh, these things are woven together in a system of activities, how they're gonna deliver for their customers. Uh, their business models in particular uh, are sort of areas of focus. They really specialize and differentiate in their business models. Some companies are committed to free-to-play games. Some are very category specific, um, MMOs or MOBOs as the case may be. Uh, and some are premium price publishers. And no matter what they do to do things differently, they come from that place. Each of these companies' strategies are as much a factor of their current resources and expertise as they are about where they'd like to be in the future. Second big reason that uh, the companies iterate, all companies need to focus, usually around how they're currently delivering their cash flows to both their uh, from their customers uh, to their shareholders. And um, sounds really smart to have a complex strategy. The problem is complex ones don't usually work. Simple strategies with focused execution is what really works. And that's a lot of the reasons why companies iterate as well. There's also more reasons. There's lower market acceptance risk. When you put all the capital uh, into building a game, all the cost, the money, the effort, the time, um, it's much easier to know, is there anyone out there uh, that's an audience for your title? It's easier to focus test and research it, however formally or informally. Iteration is much easier to do this. It's a lot easier to forecast financials. You can look at similar titles out there and say, hey, I can make this a little bit better and a little bit plus 10%. Uh, percent. So it's, the bottom line is, is that it's a lot easier to invest in a bigger bet that's even better for customers by giving them more of what they already love. You know, finally, and this is one thing that's uh, always been a little uncomfortable for people to admit, it's something that we've gone through as well, uh, there's a lower chance of failure. Uh, at least until the idea gets old. Uh, there's a lower chance of failure in iterative ideas because when was the last time someone got promoted at a company for failing in the marketplace? Um, well, typically if you fail in the marketplace, um, you blow up uh, and you're, it's a sort of a career limiting move. Uh, so you tend to iterate rather than do something completely different. Um, everyone seems to have the story of the brand that they helped create as uh, executives in a company. You know, I was part of X team or Y team. Usually people don't talk about, I was part of a team that took a risk and it didn't work out. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this is a big one, it's a lot easier if you're in a $100 million business to get the extra 10%, go over $10 million of revenue, or in a billion dollar business and get an extra 100 million. Wow, that sounds really like a big number, right? Then it is to get to the first 10 million of revenue on a new idea or the first $100 million of a new idea. Uh, and so for someone looking to build a career, uh, jumping off the deep end with a brand new idea, it's the reason why creative people sometimes get in the business, but it's not the best path for our, the most predictable career. Frankly, if all creative companies did was divergent thinking, uh, and so everybody in the world was doing things differently, then eventually their luck might run out. Uh, even the most divergent of innovators need some convergence and iteration. Um, but of course, the same old, same old, as we say, gets old. Um, there's always room for something new, especially now. Now, that's a lot of the reasons why we got into Valen Studios and started uh, our studio in, in the first place. Uh, but especially now, it's a good time to recognize that the industry is very cyclical. It's always in a process of consolidation and fragmentation. And there are always breakthrough new products coming supposedly out of nowhere. Usually it's a team that worked for 10 years to get the right idea going, it's been incubating forever, but supposedly all the new ideas come out of nowhere. Uh, established game categories are getting bigger. That's a, a truism. Um, you know, that's where the consolidation is happening. Only the top few MOBAs are, are getting the consumers today, the top few battle royales, the top few mass three games. Uh, and they have staying power because they can invest at scale. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, before today, uh, or you know, now, big publishers controlled access to capital, distribution, marketing, and PR. 
But at the same time, we've never experienced a time where each of these areas are more disaggregated. When it comes to new types of experiences, there's always new capital or always capital chasing new creative. The different distribution options virtually for any, any business model. And there's world-class marketing PR uh, that's looking to support the best new creative. So we frankly don't see many advantages of being within a single large organization, especially if you want to get something done that's new. There are multiple routes for new unique experiences if you're deliberate in your choices. It's not, it's not actually the field of dreams where build it and they will come. It does take a few very deliberate steps. Uh, we'll talk about our perspective on doing diver divergence. Um, the key is for us to build is for us to build ideas that are uh, simple. Uh, by simple, it uh, we mean sort of really easy to get, easy to understand, accessible. It's easy to get into and start playing. It's something that is emotional or captivating within the first few minutes of play. It doesn't take a long exposition, long um, um, sort of experience to really understand what it is and say, ah, this feels different. But simple doesn't mean it's complex under, it's not complex under the hood. A lot of times simple ideas haven't been done before because they're super hard to do. Second principle, defensible. Is there a secret sauce that makes this hard to copy? You know, I remember when the first couple uh, uh, battle royals came out and we went to uh, E3 with our, um, um, you know, working prototype for Knockout City. This was uh, 18 months in incubation and we got it to feel really good and we wanted to show it to others. And so many people thanked us for not showing them another battle royale. There were about 50 to 100 other battle royales in development because the ones that had been established had quickly gotten to scale. And uh, the new ones that were coming out were just competing for diminishing audiences. Not great barriers to entry once competitors were already at scale. So think about secret sauce. What is, why is it hard to copy? But also what the set of capabilities on your team that makes your team unique and probably the best to do it as well. Uh, third principle, is it scalable? Scalable in a sense of player engagement. Can it engage a player for hours, days, weeks, and months? And second, can you engage uh, numbers of players? Can you do hundreds of thousands of users? Can it go to millions of players? These tend to be very important because when you're taking very risky bets, hopefully there are many, many people willing to enjoy it over long periods of time. Sometimes it takes a while to figure those things out. So, you know, when we started Valence Studios, our initial focus was not about any specific game idea. It was all about defining what kind of culture we wanted to, to, to cultivate, the type of team we wanted to assemble. You know, we really wanted to bring together veteran talent as well as new talent who are all about going after bold new ideas. And so that kind of divergent thinking, it's, it starts with the team. So it's, it's really around, you know, building a core team and giving them the room to explore. You know, it's amazing how we, we hear all the time that um, a lot of brilliant creative and, and technical, you know, folks, they weren't given the room to explore. And, uh, and, you know, these are folks who are deeply curious, deeply curious about new play patterns. They're not just dreamers, but they're makers. And at Vellum, there's no separation between inventors and, and developers. It's not like we hand it off to some, some other, you know, team to go to go build, you know, we, we build it, you know, come up with the ideas and, and start building and prototyping and proving or disproving the fun. And it's all about trying to have the smallest possible team to find that atomic core unit of fun, you know, that, that, makes, that makes the game work. You know, above all, like the team needs to have permission to fail. You know, failing needs to be seen as equally as good outcome as success. It's when you don't know which one it is that, that makes it really difficult. Um, but the team needs to have that permission to, to fail so that they can actually take uh, some bold steps. So, you know, that core litmus to test is, can the team build it? And then hand the controller over to someone else to feel that magic, you know? And are people just stop playing and they walk away or they can't let go. You know, that's a, that's a really important uh, metric. You know, the, the, the second thing is like, you know, once you've kind of like defined that culture and you've, you've kind of assembled that team, 
then it's really about a sort of structured R&D process that comes second. And I'm not talking about pre-production. Pre-production comes after this sort of period of R&D. Um, you know, quite frankly, we, we place sort of minimal value on pitch decks or, you know, videos and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's really about, let's go prototype something and build something and, and prove whether something is fun or not. And it's really sort of investing against the magic that the team finds. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's the team being really passionate about going after, you know, specific problems that they're, that they're trying to solve. It's finding the magic in these core interactions that are really novel and unique and, and different. And we got to build it and iterate on it until we can put it in the outsider's hands, you know, and subject to a, a peer review and, and see what other people think. And this is, you try and be as rapid as you can. You try and not put a lot of frills around it. This isn't about, uh, you know, unless the game is about an aesthetic that you're trying to trying to define and that's what's unique about it. You know, if it's about moment to moment mechanics, as an example, you don't need a lot of art. You kind of focus down on what is really necessary to prove or disprove a, a concept and you iterate as rapidly as you can. Now the trick is, and this is challenging, is that it, it requires independent funding from the actual project funding. Because you need to have a lot of patience because the prototype might not work out. You may just have to throw it away and do something else completely different. If you're prescriptive about the project uh, from the, from the get-go when you haven't proven like the core magic uh, in something, that becomes really hard. And you know you kind of box yourself in. So so really, if you can decouple a different funding source in that R and D period, when you're looking for that magic, then you can uh, you have something that you can then take into pre-production with more of a project financing approach. So I mean, just a couple of quick examples, like with Mario Kart Live, for example, when the prototyping began, it was not about making a Mario Kart game. You know, it was actually inspired from drone racing and it was about bringing this visceral feel of driving an RC car in the real world, but making it drive as easily as a video game car. Then it was bringing video game rules around it, you know, to make it a fun game experiment. And this, this was a self-funded prototype, which was risky, especially since we didn't know if there was a dare there with this, this sort of experience. And we were lucky, you know, we, we actually found that magic uh, kind of early. It was about in that you know, seven to nine month type of window that we were able to, uh, to, to unlock what was special about it. With Knockout City, we had this core idea of throwing and catching a ball. And every three months or so, we thought we had this core figured out. We put it in the hands of trusted peers and it failed. It wasn't, wasn't fun, there were problems with it. But the team kept at it and it actually took 18 months to really nail that core experience that felt great in, in people's hands. Sometimes it's really hard to know, you know, when you should cut bait on an idea and move on or keep going. And at the end of the day, you gotta trust the team and, uh, and decide as a team whether you wanna keep going or uh, do something else. You know, at the end of the day, when you're kind of green lighting a, a project and you're kind of going into full pre-production and production with the intention of building it, you know, we believe that the, the creative should drive the go-to-market strategy. And this is often like the opposite of what actually happens um, in companies and in, in large scale companies. It's, it's usually identifying a market opportunity and saying, hey, we need to go after these kinds of consumers or battle royales are awesome. You know, they're really hot, let's go make a battle royale. Um, by the way, if you play Battle Royales, <laughs> nothing wrong with Battle Royales, but like it's more of a methodology, um, you know, where companies often focus on the market and then say, hmm, what product should we build? As opposed to you figure out something special and new. And again, this is the path of divergent new ideas that creative drives the go-to-market strategy. And so when you, when you do have that magic, when you do have that prototype, that, uh, that's really special and unique, you then figure out what the right go-to-market strategy is. Sometimes you can go at it on your own, other times you need the right kind of partner you know, to be able to take it out to market. And if you've, again, proven the fun 
and you can put in their, their hands, it's a lot easier to go find the right partner where it really just kind of clicks, the vision clicks, uh, the, uh, they, they really understand the game experience and the audience. Um, but you can do it independently. And if you do, it, if you do it that way, you can start small, but you want to get it really community focused and, and into players' hands as uh, quickly as possible. Now, like Mario Kart Live is a very different set of go-to-market challenges than, than Knockout City. You know, with, with Mario Kart Live, we had a hardware and software experience that we needed to, to build at scale. And Nintendo was the right partner for us, um, you know, for that project. And with Knockout City, it's a digital-only live service, you know, game with, uh, with, a, with a lot of infrastructure requirements to pull that off. And we talked to a number of different potential partners when we had our prototype. And, and EA, and particularly with the EA Originals label, you know, became the right partner for us. The ultimate goal is, you know, is getting it into gamers' hands. You know, that, that's what we're really trying to do. Now, we've talked a lot about divergence, uh, divergent thinking. There's a point at which you got to make the sucker. So um, this is where the dreamers have to become doers transition from divergent to convergent in order to build it and ship it and evolve it. So sustainability is all about saying, hey, look, we found the magic. Uh, we know what really is something special and new. We figured out here's a risky but viable pathway to market. Here are the partners that we need to do it. You got to put it on a timeline. You have to make it. Um, building and shipping it and then evolving it is really how, sort of how we think about this as sort of a complete package. Um, building is iterative. Um, it extends beyond launch. But we don't think that it's, uh, or, and, and part of that is because player feedback is key. This is something totally new. So you think you know how players will respond to it. You can even focus test it along the way and that kind of thing. But you don't really know until your experience is out in the wild. You know, we, we didn't really, we put track creation into Mario Kart Live, uh, but there isn't a native sharing feature in Mario Kart Live. We were astounded that there's so many makers out there that are building amazing courses and posting them and making the experience really their own. It gives us a real insight into UGC in the real world. Something that we found out, uh, we knew that building was a fun part of what we're doing. We didn't think that the community would embrace it quite the way that they uh, wound up doing it. So shipping it is just a step along the way of delivering an amazing experience. But, uh, and then budgeting and planning is harder in this context because uh, when you're looking at, okay, well, how much do I have to build into this before it needs to get out? Um, what kind of break even do I need to have? They don't have easy comparables. Um, so keeping it as tight as possible in that initial feature spec is super important because you are taking a risk because eventually the market needs to accept it and then you need to you know, go from there. Now, uh, the fundamental truth, and I think every developer has encountered this, especially on new stuff, everything takes a lot longer and costs more than you think. So build some safety margin in there in, in your system as well uh, as you're doing this. Importantly though, and we've heard a lot of talk about this um, in software and startup culture, Minimal viable product is a really hard concept for us to get our heads around. Minimal viable product often means, hey, look, you just have this little bit and people are gonna pay, pay you for it. And then you can take it to whatever future it needs to have. Uh, what we think we need to do is determine the scope of the experience that feels complete at launch, but has the potential to grow. That represents a value for your pricing model, but then you can evolve it from there. Um, you know, fundamentally, it's about finding your audience, listening, and evolving it with a player community. And all of this is a combination of iteration, about being as rigorous as you can be, patient as you can be, and getting the thing out. So all of these, these, these are sort of, it's sort of a four-part concept. Um, uh, you know, we sum summarize it in our business plan that we've actually posted here. This is a big, you know, complicated, as you can see. Uh, plan. Now, just a little bit, bit of background. You know, Karthik and I both have MBAs. Uh, there's a proverb in Silicon Valley: you take the number of engineers, multiply it by ten, divided by the number of engineer, uh, divided by the number of MBAs that you have, and that's your IQ as a company. 
So <laughs> uh, fortunately, uh, there's just the two of us and there's lots of great people here at Valen. Uh, we've experienced being indie before it was cool when we first started. Uh, we've been in large studio environments as well um, and with mega franchises. Now, being back at Indie, it's fine for a different, kind of, it was important for a different kind of plan. Um, you know, beyond the 50 to 100 page decks, before, but beyond all the market studies and things like that, we really laid it out to the simplest possible method that we can have. So build an awesome team. Uh, find the magic in something new that the team is truly passionate about because passion drives the patience and the insight for innovation. Figure out how to get to market because if it's really great, there's probably a way to do that. And probably partners that can help you do it uh, as well. And then build it, ship it, evolve it with a community. So that's what we set out in October, 2016. Um, and uh, look, some of this is a work in progress. Um, We've had some success with Mario Kart Live. We have great expectations for Knockout City. We think you're gonna love that too. But what we found overall is that simple is hard. So it's always easier said than done. So every bit of the plan, you know, simple plans have a shot at working because there's a million details to execution and execution has to be great, uh, both for consumers as well as to compete in the marketplace. Um, Complex strategies tend to fail because you're stacking complex strategies on top of complex execution. So the most important thing for you to uh, do in all of this is to be able to say, how simple can I make my effort and my proposition? Uh, well, we're on a journey. Uh, good luck on your journey. You know, when we look for ideas, we look for the best ideas that are simple and powerful with hidden depth and nuance. We try to find them in creative people everywhere and bring them, to, bring them together in an awesome team. Our effort at Valen Studios is to build a sustainable model to do this. Um, we just wish that as many people that can do this are doing this because I think that'd be great for the industry, great for consumers, great for players everywhere. Thank you. Thanks for spending 30 minutes with us and, uh, and, and listening to, to, uh, to this talk. Appreciate it. Take care.